Welcome everybody to this week's Power Hour. We are going to continue to talk about the impact of COVID-19 and the impact on our mental health and our well-being. And last time, if you joined us last time, you will recall that we talked about that from a uh, patient's perspective. And today we're going to shift that around and talk about the provider's perspective and talk about how our providers doing in this and almost a year into this pandemic. As you may recall, the Power Hour is offered to you by the North Carolina Medical Society Foundation and Keynup Institute for Physician Leadership in particular. I'm here today with my colleague Aubrey Cuthbertson and as always our eminent moderator Franklin Walker. Just as a small reminder, Power Hour started as a way to really focus on what we can do in the, in the hard times that the pandemic brought which is to keep conversation, uh, focus on collaboration, and above all, focus on community. And I want to thank everybody who's here today and taking the time to be part of this. Uh, we appreciate you and appreciate you being part of this effort that we are trying to do. As always, these sessions are recorded and will be available at the uh, Kipple landing page sometime midweek next week. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Franklin. And again, thank you so much. And Franklin, it's all yours. Thank you, Tina. Welcome, everybody. Good to see some of you returning this week. Um, as Tina said, last week we had a session with some providers, most of them were behavioral health, talking about the effect of the COVID pandemic on their patients. And this week we want to focus on how it's affected you guys, our guests, and your colleagues, okay? And there's been a lot in the press recently. Um, there's a New York Times article just the other day that we had contributed to actually from our CPP program and the foundation and talked about the psychological trauma of rationing care that's hitting the physicians. Also, Physicians Foundation survey said that 8% uh, primary or uh, private practices have closed during that mm -hmm. time. That represents about 16,000 fewer private practices. New England Journal of Medicine says there's a parallel pandemic of psychological trauma among healthcare workers, and the list goes on. Anyway, so we're going to delve into some of those things today. But before we get into that, I do want to take a brief moment to go around to the guests and let you take an opportunity to introduce yourselves and tell us uh, about your organization and your role within that organization, and then we'll get into talking about the pandemic effects. So, Dr. Cormac O'Donovan, can I start with you, please, sir? Yes, um, I'm Cormac O'Donovan. I'm a neurologist. I've been at um, Wake Forest for 25 years um, on the faculty there. Um, my... Um, interest or motivation or start with sort of some personal experience like many physicians with physician burnout and since then i've been kind of working uh, within the field of neurology and wake forest um, to kind of bring attention to this and try and make a difference my role per se um we have a one part of the thing we are trying to do at wake forest um is a peer support program. Um, there are other initiatives which we'll talk about, I guess, through the program. Um, but I've also been involved with some statewide initiatives um, associated with the North Carolina Medical Society and at a neurology level, um, National Professional Society. So those are kind of my scope of um, contribution to this conversation today. Super. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Robin Jordan, hello. How are you? Tell us a little bit about your organization, please, ma'am. Uh, so I am a psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist, and I work at UNC and run UNC's addiction medicine program. And um, our, our patient population uh, is pretty much the state of North Carolina, so we take care of patients from all over, which telemedicine has really assisted us with. Um, so I think that's that's it. That's it? Okay. Yeah. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Dr. Mary McCrary, how about you, please? Hi, thank you for having me. I am a general outpatient internist in Durham, trained in Chapel Hill and, and, uh, and didn't go very far. And I've been practicing in the area for 
almost 19 years now, initially at Durham Internal Medicine and now at Duke Signature Care. And my um, role I, on this panel is I'm very interested in physician wellness. I serve as one of the well-being champions, one of the two uh, well-being champions for the North Carolina chapter of the ACP, which is the American College of Physicians, the National Internal Medicine Society. And then I also trained as an integrative health and uh, wellness coach because I was interested in using those skills for my patients and then found out it was so valuable to use for physician wellness as well. So I've been um, doing some coaching and also been creating some initiatives for wellness for internists in North Carolina. Super. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to our folks from Burlington Pediatrics next. Um, Dr. Yun Bolston and Dr. Alexandra Caputo, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your organization, please? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, um, to join. Um, I am uh, a, a primary care pediatrician at Burlington Pediatrics and Mebane Pediatrics, uh, which is an independent private practice in Alamance County. And um, I'm a huge fan of Kipple, um, so it's really hard to say no to anything that Kipple asks. Uh, just because it's been such a, an important part of my professional growth journey. Um, so really excited to be here. Uh, for my leadership college um, uh, project, my focus um, several years ago was on uh, a provider, healthcare provider and team wellness. And so this speaks actually pretty closely um, to, to my heart. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Ali um, Capito, who is our clinical psychologist at the practice. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dr. Kibito, so I'm the clinical psychologist and behavioral health consultant. And so my role, I'm a consultant to the primary care physicians, and a large part of my role is supporting um, their wellness, and particularly in um, relation to dealing with patient care. Um, and then I obviously also work <laughs> directly with patients, more kind of a short-term model, and helping them connect to longer-term services if necessary. Super. Um, and last on this question, but not least, Dr. Jeannie Byrne. Good to see you again, Jeannie. Thank you for being with us again. Um, and give us a little bit about yourself, please. Great. Thanks for inviting me back. So I am an adult psychiatrist by training, and I work for Caremore and Aspire Health, which is a national healthcare delivery um, system under the Anthem umbrella. We specialize in Medicare and Medicaid typically the most sick patients, the top 10%, the most complex cases, both behavioral and physical health. And I am the chief behavioral health officer as well as the VP for clinical excellence. And we have about I think, 180 patients nationally and we will be in North Carolina in a couple months. That's exciting. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so now let's get into what we're gonna talk about today is how COVID has affected you guys in, in your profession. So, Jeannie, since I've got you, I'm going to start with you. Um, first question, what's transpired in your professional setting, setting since the onset of COVID, and how has that caused the most stress? And again, recognizing that you represent this organization that's far flung in many states, um, I'm going to be very interested, and our guests will be interested in your answer, how that might be a different stressor in Southern California versus Washington, D.C. And this question is about you and your colleagues. I love this question. So I guess thinking about it in two ways. So just in terms of kind of chronologically as the pandemic has progressed and then maybe the second part more like geographically um, how things have looked different. So chronologically speaking, when March hit last March, I think we went through all of the phases of uh, disaster or trauma and we had a honeymoon phase at the beginning. There was a lot of anxiety, but the organization pulled together. Um, our providers, I think at that point felt very cared for. We were very involved. Um, a lot of operational considerations, right? We shifted to virtual care as an organization. So I think people were anxious, but at the same time felt cared for. So I would say at the beginning, we actually had a bit of a honeymoon where everybody really came together. Not that many people were sick. We had a couple staff members get sick, um, but people felt, I think, pretty good for a while. Things got messier. Um, I would say that 
there's been ups and downs as the pandemic progressed when we shifted from virtual back into in person or kind of a hybrid model there was a lot of anxiety around that and then um, I'd say the last six months um, there's been a lot of fatigue that has just built I would say it's just every month it's like more and more and the fatigue is the providers are tired like physically tired they're emotionally tired. The ones that are in the hospital are um, dealing mm-hmm. with death. I, we have providers that rationed care um, in California. Um, they're exhausted, honestly. Like, they are just kind of done. <laughs> so I think where we're at, like, chronologically at this point is just sheer exhaustion and definitely some empathy fatigue. Um, psychologically speaking, our providers are having more and more trouble maintaining that empathy with patients and with each other. I think people are a little bit on a short fuse. Now with the vaccines, um, the providers have been getting vaccinated. I think that's been a little better. Like as people are getting their second dose, I feel like there's some relief. And so my hope is we're kind of chronologically you know, moving out of some of the, the most dire exhaustion. So that's the chronological story. And then the geographic story has been really interesting, especially in the West part of the country. So this is where I like to say that North Carolina, I know it feels pretty bad here, but I think actually our colleagues in other parts of the country um, have suffered in an even more profoundly um, perhaps than we have here, specifically in Southern California. Mm-hmm. Um, my colleagues in Southern California, they are, they are beyond exhausted because people have been sick. Uh, family members have gotten sick. Family members have died. I've had a couple of colleagues with family members who've died. People are out. They're out on PTO. They're out on bereavement. They're out because they're sick. They're out because their kid's sick. So, you know, our staffing is severely strained by absenteeism um, related to COVID. So the people who are still working, um, are stretched very, very thin. Um, they're just really exhausted, honestly. And so I think geographically, the worst of it in Southern California, um, then Arizona and Nevada, I would say are second hot spots that have been the worst. And honestly, our East Coast um, practices seem to have fared better. I don't know exactly why. I think the absenteeism perhaps has been lower um, because of the cultures of the staff members. Um, Another interesting cultural part, which I talked about last time, is our um, Latinx um, colleagues on the West Coast, especially in L.A., seem to really have suffered from the pandemic. Um, So our Latinx staff members have, I think, suffered the most as a group, from what I can Mm -hmm. tell. So it's kind of a geographic, but cultural. East Coast, um, we don't have as many like Latinx staff members. We have more... um, Uh, white or African-American on the East Coast. And that group, at least our staff has done better. So they're not quite as exhausted. Right. Um, Follow-up question very quickly. In terms of your, you mentioned California probably being the worst of it. um, And certainly people are exhausted. Have you had your colleagues just raise their hands and say, I can't take anymore. I'm retiring or I'm quitting. Um, Has that started to happen in your organization? I haven't heard of anybody retiring. I have Uh had some people go out on leave. Yeah. um, Yeah. Which is somewhat, I think there's been some emotional leave and then bereavement. People have taken longer than usual bereavement periods, I would say. Yeah. Super. Thank you for that answer. Um, Now I'm going to come back to my East coast people. Um, So Yun and Allie, you guys are, you know, in a, you know, pediatric practice in three locations, Burlington, Mebane area of North Carolina tends to be a little rural. So tell us, same question to both of you guys. Yun, you can start if you want to um, and talk a little bit about what's been going on with you guys there. Sure. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, there are, there are definitely challenges being in our area, um, but also a lot of strengths as, as I was um, kind of contemplating that question uh, for, for us. Um, you know, as we've implemented um, telehealth, we had to um, get that off the ground really quickly last March. Um, and so it was a lot of growth opportunity. Um, but, it, you know, the, the challenges of doing something more and different on top of our current work 
challenges. I think for providers, you know, even excitement can be a stress and that was definitely stressful. Uh, and I think for us, the other parts are um, being in a private practice. I think we feel some of the financial um, stressors a little bit more immediately um, just because it's a little bit closer to home. Um, and, and we're not really shielded like a large systems providers. And so a lot of that we were juggling up, you know, um, several balls in the air. And I think for us collectively as a group, you know, high uncertainty, you know, we definitely felt um, the, the need and, um, and desire to be there for our staff. And, and so I, I think there was um, certainly a, a high level of fear too, in terms of like personal safety, you know, how are we gonna see patients and stay safe uh, so a lot of dimensionality um, and, and speaking to um, Jeannie's point, I think the stamina is um, that's a definite issue a year into it. You know, the first three months we were um, doing, um, you know, practice wide um, debriefs and huddles and meetings and we continue to do that. Um, but I think it's really difficult because it's not like there is a finite finish line that we see anywhere close to, um, to, to coming up. Uh, but in terms of our area, I think some of the things that, that have increased some of the challenges for us, um, you know, broadband, I, I know that's a big issue, but you know, now 20% of our visits are telehealth. And so it really is disruptive and frustrating when we can't get people on to connect. Uh, and I think that with um, our area, you know, we have really great um, supports. You know, we definitely have public health, um, you know, um, superheroes in our area, um, but we're admittedly really short staffed. You know, this is Alamance County. Um, so we don't have a lot of the big centers to really rely on for support. And so some of the, um, the resources are frankly limited and, and Dr. Capito can certainly speak to this. We've had incredible challenges with um, getting access to care for our um, you know, patients who have suicidal ideation, um, where CPS is involved. And so that has been an incredible, you know, the emotional labor on that part is, is really high. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Capito. And uh, not that it makes it any easier, but when it's collaborative within our practice and we can troubleshoot together um, and really commiserate together too, because there are some really dicey situations that we've been part of. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Capito to speak more about that. Yes, that is one of the biggest challenges that I'm finding. And I actually did my fellowship at UNC, so I only moved 30 uh, minutes down the road here. But just the difference between Burlington and Chapel Hill is um, huge in terms of resources. And so especially, I think pre-pandemic, we were having difficulty connecting patients to especially mental health care. And then the pandemic hit, and what I found was a lot of the bigger institutions had said, if you're not a patient, like if you're not a patient at Duke, we will not take outside patients here. And so the referrals was really challenging. And personally for me, that was hard because I was already at capacity. And I think some of the similar ways that you all have had to ration care, I have also had to ration care um, and that, that's really challenging. And then the other piece, and I think this is probably universal with suicidal adolescents, um, parents are hesitant to take them to ED, especially right now with COVID. Um, and so I would try to encourage them, you know, there's places that are walking specifically for behavioral health, not locally. So that was a bit of a drive. Um, so that's been kind of a specific population that's been really difficult. Um, and then the other patient population that's been really difficult in the area is our LGBTQ youth. Um, and I have, as a provider, found that really challenging. And I don't think I realized the extent to which schools were a safe haven and now seeing these kids stuck at non-supportive homes, um, you know, I think is just um, personally really challenging. Um, that being said, I do think we have um, done everything we can to come together as a team and really support each other um, through all of this. And I've been so grateful um, to my colleagues kind of, um, kind of during this time, but it's just, um, you know, really, really challenging in so many ways, especially in the area we are and um, given the, um, constraints for behavioral health services. Right, thank you. Um, Dr. O'Donovan, are you there? Can't see you. Yes, I am. Okay, I wanna give you a chance to answer that question, given that you again are back in a larger system. Yes, um, very interested in what, um, if you look at the whole spectrum and hear what Yun and Ali had to say. Um, mm -hmm and also Jenny's part. Um, let, let me speak about the academic center, um, plus and minuses, uh, protected somewhat. I'm very 
sympathetic to the small practices and I do have friends who work in small practices. So I'm um, very empathetic for their challenges. In my world, um, I'm fortunate in that in the field of epilepsy and sleep disorders, um, I can do a lot of my work through telehealth. So I feel blessed. I mean, I've gone through this journey where I have um, best friends and family who are in Ireland and wondering if I'm you know, in the front line, like was advertised in New York in the first phase called January and March. But even within our department, we have, although we're a group, we have different needs and different perspectives. Let me just kind of highlight a few things. Um, let me talk about the telehealth. I'll say, for example, um, in my specialty, not only done by video, but also done by phone connections and I think um, Yun and Ali might be able to answer this even more, but the, the connections are still poor. Mm -hmm. And you might assume that somebody has a video. So I'm very concerned that um, things like phone visits will not get reimbursed in the future because it's not about me, it's more about the patients. I mean, it is, and there is some concerns. Um, we've had to... Um, <clears throat> We moved, of course, completely to telehealth when it hit, so to speak, in March and April. And then we morphed into having people coming in, uh, in person. You know, what was interesting was that the patients, I mean, I've been here for 20 years and epilepsy is a chronic disease, so they were worried about themselves, but they're also worried about losing contact with their provider. So I think there was a plus to it. And, you know, the conversation in the visits in March, April, and May were, will we ever see you again? And I said, well, we're going to be in contact anyways. Um, and some of them want to come for visits. What we're doing right now um, is that I have, for the most part, telehealth, but I have days where I do in person. But with the uh, recent surge through the winter to mix it up. So if you're coming for an in-person visit and waiting lists can be high in an academic center because of some of the challenges that are there uh, with accessibility, um, we've offered them um, different parts. I've, I will say that a couple of things that we have done is um, leadership is key and information is key and going over it. So if you were to ask me what was the biggest activity we had, we would have departmental meetings and we would bring our COVID experts from infectious disease to answer questions. It was very good, it could be better, because I think a lot of people, you could see the chat line and the questions being very, because it's very different to know, um, for example, um, you know, what is, the, since we did do, we took, we were able to engage telehealth very well within our section, but then again, what are we going to do about our clinic visits? And they were becoming more cumbersome. So there was strains on other providers. Um, I think things have got, you say, better. Um, but I think even though we are an academic center with faculty, we still have challenges to meet all members of our departments. So for example, residents, and I don't, I work on an epilepsy monitoring unit, but I'm not working in the intensive care, but I do hear from them. There's a lot of challenges between, you know, what are the residents doing and how people are restructuring war drowned. So it's, it's a multifaceted thing, but I also think, you know, it's, um, the conversation changes, you know, if, I guess we were absorbed with, in a survival mode and we still are, but going forward about losing that connection. And, um, you know, we've obviously made some adjustments. I think it'll be, you know, it's not me to say it'll be a new world, but how we'll be able to integrate. So it's neither near there there. So if you ask me, Yes, it'll be, I have the option of doing sort of telehealth and that. But I am, um, you know, we were talking about absenteeism and I think Ali and others and Jenny would be more able to talk about this, but I'm worried about presenteeism because when we looked at absenteeism rate, we know that people are quitting. I was talking to some ER folks and nurses are going in mass exodus, but there's a more peculiar threshold is the people who turn up to work, are they, are they really present? And that's the issue. Whereas, and that's the conflict where people turn up and then it's seen as bad performance. Well, the other option is to call in sick, you know? I mean, my daily reminder, my daughter, you know, works 
as a nurse on a on an um, inpatient floor and you know i have to um every day after the shift i know i'm going to get my call at eight o'clock about the stories about who had covid and what temperature is a covid temperature so and again i was i will say that we tackled with the schools you know it's not to be i was very concerned about the childcare issues and i've seen people although we have remote working they really are trying to be creative to be honest i'm not trying to call them out, but I have, you know, I've been here for 25 years. I've worked with a lot of groups and I'm concerned about people just trying to make it work at home because that dilemma should, are you teaching your child? I apologize, Yun, I'm not a pediatrician, but am I teaching my child and these stories where they don't want to be seen to be weak? And the answer is why not? Because they're again, afraid of losing the job. We're talking about there's lots of jobs in healthcare and we had enough people, but then there's a money issue. But anyways, the main things I'm seeing is it's going to go through a phase. And I mean, I'll finish on a note. I'm not finishing, but just for now, saying it's interesting, a note of optimism, you know, um, if you keep the hope. I mean, I have noticed a lot of, um, a little bit of emotional resurgence with the vaccine, okay? Because I hang around with the providers, I'm not sure. I'm still trying to do my bit about the hesitancy. And I find actually I'm spending in some of my more stable patients and trying to contribute to the cause and do my bit because the specialist might be the only doctor they say and have a talk about the vaccine and I have a line. And so anyways, those are a lot of the challenges that are happening. Um, I think it's an ongoing thing. Did we learn enough to be adaptable to whatever stress? You know, I'd throw that out there. You know, we had a stressed system, COVID exposed it. So not to be a pessimist, but in, let's say in 2022, or 2023, are we clear on how we will work together? As Simon Sinek said, let's make the safe space even bigger so the threat becomes smaller. I'm not sure that we're there, you know? In other words, a little bit more recalibration may help. But those are, obviously it's, um, as you can hear from my talk, it's a passionate thing, but I think it's multifaceted and you have to take, although there are group themes, people are worried about infecting. Now I notice is that people are worried about bringing the COVID home. Whereas I guess six months ago, you're worried if your family was worried you're going in as a healthcare provider, would you contract COVID? So again, lots of different dynamics. And um, I, I think the, the bottom line is you have to look at each person individually because some people might still be in the phase of being afraid of contracting, which is an issue, but others might be worried about, you know, where they go or would they, their job be eliminated because of finances or new technology? So lots of different things there. Yeah. Thank you, Cormac, so much for that. Uh, Robin, I want to come to you lastly on this question um, and, and see what your thoughts are, given that you're another system person being in UNC. Sure. Um, for being in psychiatry and addiction, um, there's the obvious stressor that we've had of increased demand um, and increased acuity um, for the department of psychiatry. And I mean, I do primarily addiction and, and so talking for the, for the department of psychiatry and what they're experiencing is tremendous. And I, and I don't think any of us even six months ago really appreciated the demand that was coming. Um, and, uh, the consult service, the psychiatry consult service. I mean, it used to be that there were 15 or 20 patients on this service. There's regularly 70 patients on this service. They have more patients on the consult service than they have in the entire psych hospital. And there's no extra staff to manage that. Um, the, the demand is just, it's unreal. And then we're in this position of we've got our trainees and how much are we training our trainees versus mm -hmm. having them in a service role and burning them out and just making them work as opposed to providing training opportunities. So that, that's a struggle that Department of Psychiatry is facing. And then on the, the addiction piece of this can't be ignored. And my colleagues are coming to me saying, we're getting all these referrals for anxiety, depression, but then we find out they're on methamphetamine, they're on cocaine, they're on heroin, and we've never dealt with this before. And so I'm finding more and more colleagues saying, help, you know, and it's just, it's just me, like, you know, help now, treat, teach us, we're listening now, teach us how to treat addiction. Um, and the, the addiction severity 
has definitely increased and, and we've always had a window we take because of limited resources we take people at highest risk of overdose death that's been my criteria for three years now and even that i'm having to pick and choose who gets in of the people that we've deemed are highest risk of overdose death and we had a death this week which is um i'm still processing because someone couldn't get access to care so the the acuity and severity is enormous and that certainly is um is something i continue to feel there's a couple other things i wanted to point out when this all started i had to make decisions for my team of who would i put in the hospital because we have an in hospital inpatient addiction service and what um what was my uh confidence that i could put my team in the hospital and that they would remain safe at a time where we had limited ppe um, and so there was really a great sense of responsibility on my shoulders to make sure that I was keeping my team safe because one, that's just the right thing to do. But second, I needed them. I couldn't have my team out because we're so limited resourced. I you know, really can't afford to lose a team member um, to, you know, out for a couple of weeks being sick, but, but really feeling that just um moral responsibility of am i putting them in an unsafe situation so that was difficult for me um and then getting very personal for me i have a family member who was who would be high risk with covid infection so you know i'm one of these doctors in that position of am i what what extra things that I, do i do at work what extra exposures do i have versus not doing those things to take care of my family member and that has been and continues to be probably the biggest stressor that i have of needing to take care of my family but also knowing all these responsibilities that i have um, so the last thing i'll add and i don't know i've not talked to a lot of other physicians about this but the the provider guilt mm -hmm. i'm not on the front line i'm not in the icu i'm not having patients multiple patients die a day i had one this week that's heartbreaking for me and like feeling guilt about that and feeling guilt that I'm not in that situation. I'm overwhelmed. I'm doing everything I know I can do, uh, but then still feeling like I'm not in the position that others are in that's, you know, I'm still very fortunate that I'm not in this position others are in, but I'm also not able to be in that position because I have a family member I have to care for. So, I mean, for me, that provider guilt and that balance is tough. Um, so you know, those are the, things that I'm experiencing and noticing. Right, thank you for that, Robin. Um, Marion, I wanna give you an opportunity to chime in on this same question, please. Yes, I, I was um, just thinking when you were speaking, Dr. Jordan, about the compassion and having that for yourself and I guess all that we've gone through, but also you know, having it for our patients. Um, the scenario I was going to bring up um, in addition to what we've already talked about is, is this past month has just been very hard navigating how to get our patients vaccines. So as a primary care physician, we're trying to kind of help in any way that we can, whether that be, you know, sending them a message every day of here's how we know how you can get it, or here's how to sign up. And it's been um, a struggle, I think, for us because we want to be the best at it. We want all of our patients to have it. It's our expectations and they want it and they're calling and asking. And so when we're met with, you know, the scarcity of the number of the vaccines and also the changing directives, um, we know why they've changed the directives, but it's still hard to be able to sometimes process that, um, as you said, and also, you know, to help patients understand that. So that's something that we've been struggling with more recently is how, how to manage those expectations for ourselves and our patients of what we want to get across to them. And, um, and to be there for each other. I think the other thing that we're all trying to find is a way to find community with other physicians, with other clinicians, to be able to have these conversations about difficult situations that we're going through. And, and that's something with um, my role in the ACP is we're trying to just get people on Zoom calls just like this to have conversations. And maybe it's one topic and just, okay, open the floor. What does that mean for you? And what do you need? And, and really just being supports for each other. So um, 
those are the, the challenges that I'm seeing right now and mm -hmm. um, the things that we're trying to address. Um, and I, I've actually, I, I wrote a little blurb about, um, you know, what we were experiencing with the, with the COVID vaccines and all the emotions and what we were doing. Instead of the three W's, I called it the three C's. Um, and so having compassion, having communication and having collaboration. And so that, that's something that I think we can kind of take across all of these themes, these, those themes across what we're doing with wellness for ourselves and for our patients. I love the three C's. Okay. Um, so I want to move into another direction um, that actually Marion helped me get there. I wanted to ask you guys some questions, but I want to talk about the emergence of the vaccines and how that has affected your work, mm -hmm. hopefully in a better way. And then also how the CDC's guidelines have kind of been all over the place. And I guess it would be kind to say they've evolved over time, right? And so I want to take those two topics and kind of let you guys kick that around. Marion, since you're still here, can you take those on really quickly? One is, of course, how the vaccines, not with your patients, but you got, you're seeing patients, so have you had the vaccine? How has that helped alleviate maybe some of your stress? And then how, what are the trials and tribulations of those guidelines that have ebbed and flowed a little bit? Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it, you know, there, we, I say have compassion for your patients who haven't gotten the vaccines because think about how you felt before you got it. I mean, we were really just like, when are we gonna get it? How are we gonna get it? I um, actually switched clinical roles. So I was a couple weeks behind my partners. And one of the first things when I came into this role was like, okay, how do I get signed up for the vaccine? So I think it's just having something that we can do, um, kind of moving us forward, hopefully towards an end of all of this is so key to our psyche and just our, our energy for this. And so I think that, Having an option for the vaccine and hopefully what that's going to mean downstream is just a big relief. And um, I think doctors in general like routine. We like to know what to do next. Um, you know, we've learned it in our training. And when we have um, this ups and downs of the guidelines that we're following and what we need to do, it's it's hard. Um, you know, we all want that cutting edge. We want the new science. We want to be at the the first of the line and the forefront of what we know can help, but we also also like kind of sitting in our little comfort zone. So, so I think it's been an emotional roller coaster for us, um, but hopefully it's going to lead to lead us down where the path that we want to go and to to kind of move towards the end of this pandemic. So, cross your fingers. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeannie, how about you? vaccines and CDC? Uh, so first, personally, I'll say, so I actually have not gotten the vaccine. I do not see patients actively right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've decided, I've gone back and forth. I have a family member at home with a chronic condition that I want to protect. So part of me says I should just go ahead. And yep. part of me says there are people who need it more than I do. So I should hang back. So I've put my name on a wait list, but I'm not proactively uh, tracking down a shot for myself. So that's been my personal dilemma, kind of like what Robin said, when you have a family member at home, you're trying to protect that puts you in a, in a strange situation. Um, then in terms of professionally, what I have seen with the COVID vaccines is fascinating culturally. I think I talked a little bit about this last time. Um, many of our staff do not want to get vaccinated. And again, there's a lot of cultural things at play, very kind of young, relatively healthy, you know, people in their 20s sure. from different cultures, in particular Latinx culture, um, who don't normally get flu shots. And I didn't realize this, but apparently we don't mandate the flu shot uh, for our clinicians. And I didn't realize that we didn't. Uh, I guess there's some HR reasons that we, we can't, but um, they don't want to get the, the shot. And so trying to talk with them and think about them, not just the patients, but the staff members um, not wanting to get vaccinated is fascinating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I, it's, it's very interesting. We're right in the middle of trying to have some cultural conversations around that and having some volunteers from our staff to come forward from, from different cultures, including African-American and Latinx to talk about why they or others um, may be reluctant to get the vaccine. So 
I think that's been perhaps one of the most interesting things to see is frontline healthcare workers who actively choose not to get vaccinated. Right. Um, I want to come to my Burlington Peds folks now. Um, and you guys are going to be a little different in that you're a pediatric practice, of course. Um, so I would imagine that most of your patients are not, you know, high risk, right? Um, but you guys nonetheless are seeing patients, and I'm sure some of that is you're seeing some tests become positive in your practice. Um, so again, the question is, how has the vaccine affected your work life, and how has it been navigating those guidelines as they changed over time? Great, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, um, Jenny actually speaks to a really important point. So for us, just to give you kind of a snapshot, um, and of course this is our location at this um, point in time, and I think that children are a bit missed from the overall conversation on vaccines and COVID, um, but we um, have really ramped up internal testing um, quite quickly. And so in January, we conducted over 700 tests in-house, and our positivity rate is like over 20%. Um, and so that kind of speaks to um, kind of the flip side of this, which is you're, you're, you know, statistically you're going to be okay, but don't go kill your grandma. You know, and so I think that really speaks to um, the challenges we have that the immediacy of you being sick that, um, you know, some families tend to dismiss that or, you know, they're not quite so tight with the quarantine because I, I don't think that they recognize some of the potential consequences um, because they're not the ones that would be considered higher risk. Um, internally as a, um, uh, as, as a business, um, uh, and admittedly, and maybe Ali could speak to this too, um, I personally had some disappointment uh, that, you know, you, you think that, um, you know, and we we're very pro-vaccine. We have a vaccine policy at our practice, very robust in terms of um, advocating for vaccines, uh, but, uh, um, you know, a significant number of our uh, staff um, have declined vaccines and and even this is even with an incentive of we offer free um, paid hours and time off the schedule to go schedule your vaccine and go get it and this is for both the initial and the booster um, and so I you know it's um, and we shared that with the pediatric society too and uh, a lot of the independent practices have taken that up um, so happy to kind of share that, but you know, it's um, incentive, incentivizing is very different from, um, you know, from motivating people. And I think that maybe the, the broader concern about the vaccine. So we just uh, completed a, um, a survey of um, among all our patients and we had over 600 respondents. And I think you might be really surprised, uh, you know, and the questions posed were, um, do you personally plan on getting the vaccine when you're, you're eligible? And overall, it was less than 60% of people who in our area who said that they would. And the secondary question was, do you plan on getting the vaccine for your children when they're eligible? And the answer was around 50%. Um, and for certain demographics, those answers were significantly lower. And so I, I think that for us, um, helping to improve that dialogue, I think that you know, for public policy right now, because it's so urgent, just get the vaccines out and people will take them. Um, but I think that we're not going to like the consequences of that. Um, healthcare disparity in terms of the vaccines is real. And in an area like ours, I think um, if we don't do, if we don't discuss the value and the importance um, of the vaccine and, and um, educate people before they get their information on social media, I think that's going to be a critical juncture in how successful the vaccination program actually is. Sure. That's great. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll add in there, I, it has been very disappointing to see the staff um, not wanting to get the vaccine. And I think, especially hearing some of the pseudoscience and the kind of mistrust of the science, um, you know, is, is a little bit <laughs> infuriating, honestly. Um, and then on the flip side, some of my psychology um, colleagues who do see in-person patients um, are having tremendous guilt about getting it. They're saying, you know, I want my dose to go to that essential worker at the um, grocery store. I don't want to take this dose. Um, and then to speak to the changing guidelines, for psychologists, we, there were no guidelines. I called the psychology board. I switched to telehealth for the first couple months. I called the psychology board. I said, so what are the guidelines in terms of when I should return to in-person services? And they said, ask a physician. And I was like, well, I've asked eight, and they all have different opinions. Um, and then the, what made me des decide to go to in-person was I was talking to a patient and she, it was, a, I think, an eight-year-old. She was in the closet telling me about some abuse and very worried her mom was going to hear. And it was a bad connection. And I thought, 
you know, just in terms of risk benefit here, I really need to be in person for certain patients. Um, and so that, that's been really challenging to just kind of navigating, um, you know, telehealth versus in person. And there's really no guidelines on that. All right. Well, it's interesting because we were talking last week, as I said, about patients, right? And, but we got to talking about vaccines and then the staff and without just last week in the discussion and Robin was with us and Jeannie was with us um, and we had some other people on. It was really interesting to hear the reluctance in the staffs, okay? And as you know, Jeannie's got this, you know, she's all over the country. Um, so without a doubt, there's a lot of that resistance um, or reluctance, let's call it reluctance. Um, Cormac, I'd like to come back to you on this question, give you a chance as well. Um, you know, it's a twofold question. How has the emergence of the vaccine affected uh, your organization and your stress level? And then how have you guys navigated those changing CDC guidelines? Um, again, similar to others, I was struck by what Robin had said. I mean, um, very, uh, I, had, I have provider guilt, I think, she and I have some parallels here, um, as I alluded to in my earlier conversation about how I wasn't in the front line. I felt for my faculty members who are neurointensivists and inpatients. So there was a lot of provider guilt, but I, I do actually want to add something to that. We're talking with the ER physicians. I mean, something we need to think about is, you know, I went back to March and April and they were heroes, but what their concerns is they were heroes all the time. And now because it's become old, I mean, they're doing the same thing each day and they will have the same traumas. So, you know, did it have to come to a pandemic to highlight the work that an ER intensive care physician is doing every day? Um, they would say to me, um, well, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, um, there have been some places for neurologists who have been gone back to do internal medicine we weren't needed for that. There was a, somebody actually um, put out a feeler that we should take some more internal medicine lectures, but we didn't really have to bring that in to support our, our burnt out providers. I mean, I hear it from, I'm friends with the CMO and he, it's interesting. You don't have to verbalize, you hear the emotion. He just says, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And there's no point, there's no point going into the difference because you could go on and on. It is a bottomless pit. But interesting, as you said about, I had the same thing about the getting the vaccination. I got a text message from a colleague that said the portal is open and sign up. And it came late one Monday night and I was getting a vaccine within three days. I did have guilt. You know, I think if somebody alluded to, you know, should I be the one to get one first, you know, and then the next morning it broke and they didn't, you know, invite the people. So I was kind of sitting there very guilty that I had an appointment and was quite happy to be honest, give it up, you know. But as it turns out, they went into um, like open house enrollment. You could walk down, they just broke out the vaccines and they had lots of people to give it to and everybody got vaccinated. Um, you know, thinking back, and I said this before with the patients, it's interesting um, from my perspective, you know, going through this now for the last six weeks, um, talking to the patients and I do believe in the vaccine. I'm encouraging it. I have been vaccinated. You know, um, I'll sometimes put on a shield plus a mask and I'm in a high, and I'm actually doing it to advertise more than to protect myself or to feel that I'm super cautious. But that's my way of kind of, you know, advertising to people the importance of it. Now, with my patients, I would say a kind of a summary thing. There's two folds with it. It's either they're going to do it or not going to do it. I'm just wondering about my impact, although they do come to see me for 20 years. So we've almost become friends as well as a patient physician thing. And they trust me and they, you know, maybe I can change their thinking. But, um, you know, the most extreme example is, I asked Johnny, why aren't you going to get the vaccine? He says, well, my mother works in the hospital and the people who have COVID are really bad and they're dying. So intellectually, at an intellectual level, you think, well, that makes no sense because if you know it's a bad thing and you're exposed, but it's either something about if you get the vaccine, you're developing herd immunity. So it's almost like that's a lack of return on investment, you know? And then we've gouged some of the cultural things and, you know, people in minorities feeling that 
vaccines are man-made and rather than trying to possibly save people, we might be trying to kill them. So it's a real crux about how we continue that conversation, you know, and I feel I should, you know, um, you know, whose job is it out there? And the last thing is, I mean, even I haven't sensed, but there's been a great rush to get the vaccine. So the people who are not getting them are probably aren't speaking as much. I mean, I haven't, I'm in telehealth. I don't see the people and I haven't met people. I mean, I did find one of my front desk staff that I work with for 10 or 15 years and said, I said, are you going to get it? And she said, uh, I don't know. So it's a passing conversation. She said, are you going to get it? I said, of course I am. I said, well, if you get it. So people have saw this, you know, take pictures of me with my arm out and put it over there. Maybe they'll trust you if you'll do it yourself, you know. So those are the challenges, you know, for the vaccine. Right. Um, I mean, I feel, you know, I do have some guilt too, you know, probably at the rate it's been uptaken, if there's somebody who hasn't got, there's several people out there who need it more than me, but I mean, they made it available and I, I took it, but at least I can go around and maybe use that to help in some way. Sure. Well, and I think a, a lot of the hesitancy may have been in the initial phases and we move forward and millions and millions and millions more get vaccinated and they don't have a bad reaction, maybe that'll overcome some of the hesitancy. I think so. Yes, I've heard that conversation too. Yeah. yeah. Exactly yeah. where they say that. The right. people saying, well, we'll wait. Exactly. Because we're still, although the trials have been done and the safety is there and everybody in this conversation probably agrees, they want to see in reality, you know, it's like anything you market to the public, you know, it looks great oh, up yeah. front and then you see the problems. Well, yeah. Um, Robin, I want to finish this question up with you, please. Um, on, on the vaccine and how it's affected you and your practice and then those changing guidelines? Um, the, I was relieved. So it was my one ray of hope when the vaccine came out and I started realizing my team would get vaccinated because that really was a responsibility I was feeling. And I am not allowed to ask if people got vaccinated, but I'm certainly allowed to discuss it. So we discussed it every team meeting. We talked about it a lot. And fortunately, they all volunteered to me that they got vaccinated. So my whole team has been vaccinated now. We had one person who was really hesitant and um, probably three weeks into the discussion, she's like, all right, fine, y'all. Y'all convinced me. It's peer pressure. I'm just going to go do it because y'all are making me feel like I have to. So, um, so that is just a big relief to me to know my team is safe. Um, I feel like I feel strong in this. I advocate this to my team all the time. We must be talking to our patients about this. This is our responsibility and we need to let them know we got vaccinated. I just had this conversation this morning and my patient was saying, but my mom's afraid she's gonna die. I'm like, okay, well, I'm about six weeks in to my vaccine. Let your mom know I'm still alive. Um, I'm okay, you know. Um, I, I, I do feel like that's an area that we can at least have some influence and impact and feel like that's our responsibility. Um, so we're still advocating to our patients when it's your turn and we're, you know, get your shot and we're, um, uh, making that part of our routine practice as we're meeting with patients. Super. Okay, guys, we're getting close. I've got one final question, and I'm going to hold each one of you to keep it short, okay? So we're in early February. This is about the time a year ago things started appearing, right? Um, and then March, we're shut down in North Carolina, and here we are today. Um, it's been a heck of a year, to put it politely, right? Um, what is one thing that you would advise your your colleagues on? Okay, one thing only in terms of looking forward. Here we are, year in. Let's give our folks, uh, you know, a, a little help. What would that be, Robin? You're right there. I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> this will end. Uh, there's been a lot of good things that have happened. There's been silver linings along the way. We've exposed our underbelly and we're learning how to repair a lot of things and, and we will get through this. Super. Marion, how about you? I'm going to um, use some of my coaching speak here, but everything you go through, every um, trial is an experience that you can learn from. So I'm really hopeful that we can take the things that worked well during this, uh, learn from them. And I'm going to throw out a term I've been reading a lot about is post-traumatic growth is really just to see, you know, how we can make things better based on what we've learned and what's worked for us right now. Think a little positively. Yeah. Love that. 
Um, Yon and Allie, how about you guys? Um, uh, uh, two words uh, from my end, um, discipline, well, maybe it's three. Discipline, self-care, that self-care is not a treat and it shouldn't be sporadic. Uh, for me, discipline, self-care means not waking up or going to sleep with my phone. And it means intentionally limiting news um, by listening to books on tape, commuting to and from work. Allie? Yes. Um, so I have been thinking a lot about the trauma of this. And I think uh, particularly for those frontline health healthcare workers, it's going to take some time to process this trauma. I think many are still very numb. And so I, with that, I think it's important to validate your own feelings. And I, I do this with my patients all the time. I say, you know, we're in the midst of a global pandemic because I feel like we forget that. And so just kind of remembering that and remembering that, um, you know, we're going to have lots of emotions probably for years to come. And it's going to take some time to heal. Super. Thank you. Jeannie? I love what Ian said. I would build on that. I would say, you know, this is giving us an attention to mental health and substance use that we've never had. People are asking Robin, help me, help me, help me, you know, be careful what you wish for. But if you build that discipline self-care for you and your teams and for the medical profession as a whole, think of what it's going to be like when the pandemic is over. If you keep those habits, think of how much better the workforce can be how much less burnt out we can be if we continue that focus on taking care of ourselves, taking care of each other, and not having stigma around mental health and substance use. If we can keep doing that when this pandemic is over, it's going to be um, a huge improvement um, for the lives of our, our colleagues. That's great. Um, Cormac, I'm going to finish up with you, please, sir. I would say simply let's plan for 2022 without being negative because – it's really not going to be worth the effort to keep up and to judge all the news media that's going to happen. We've made it somehow not perfectly 2020. You know, if Tony Fauci calls us in September and we will arrange some parties, so be it. But let's plan for 2022, have something that might be certain, and we might have to revise it. But I think going through the guesswork will just wear us down. Uh, exhaustively. I'm not trying to be negative, but let's plan for 2022. And that puts something to look forward to and, and hope and give some hope. Super. This has been a fabulous discussion um, with the guests today. I can't thank them enough. And we ended on an upbeat um, from all of you guys, even Cormac. We'll, we'll celebrate 2022 when it gets there. Um, Tina, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you, Frank, and thank you so much to all of our guests. I think throughout the entire hour, I, would keep, I just kept thinking community and how thankful I am that there is a space and we that you, again, take the time to be part of the space and, and add on that community and keep building that community. Um, I loved uh, uh, such a, 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 an awesome conversation. I loved how you also highlighted like the positive things that actually this pandemic had brought. And I think if we can keep that at the forefront as uh, to Jenny's word, to Jenny's point, I think that can be something that we can build on already now in order for how 2022 be, you know, then we have probably, you know, solidified it somehow. Again, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that all of you will have a chance to relax this weekend and have a moment to disconnect from anything that has to do with virtual stuff. Uh, and just breathe and just be in the moment. And I do hope that we uh, see you back at some other occasion in this forum. And I also thank the people who were in the audience today. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. And I hope we see you back in another Power Hour session. Um, our next one is going to be in two weeks. And we're going to talk about uh, team-based care and thinking about how do you maintain your mental health through uh, maximizing the interprofessional team care. Uh, team-based care team. I say team a lot, but just to emphasize that aspect of what we're going to be talking about. So I welcome you back then. Without any further ado, again, remember the Power Hour is all about conversation, collaboration, and above all, really above all community. So thank you so much.